Thank you. Thank you. You're on. I'm on. Okay. I'm not. Okay. Any more questions? <laughs> We don't think the preamble that was added on at the end has some eloquence. Well, no, it, yeah. it, it, it does. I just, it, to me, I, mean, I, I don't I haven't looked at it in a while, but it seems more right. functional. Well, it is functional. It's the rules of the game, so to speak. It's, uh, it's a basic law. Uh, it's not a declaration, it's a law. So maybe that, I mean, the nature of the thing is different. Yeah, it's a legal document. It really is a legal document. The Declaration of Independence and is makes the way for a new legal order. Uh, uh, the thought of the declaration here that it's written, you know. Well, you know, Jefferson meant he said his purpose was not to s to lay down any new principles or philosophies, but to give an expression to the American mind with a, a tone appropriate for the occasion. And I think he did that. Uh, what's interesting is how much he was beholden to inherited forms. Uh, why did we have one at all? I mean, I was sort of backing into that question earlier on. If the purpose of the Declaration wasn't for France, I, I said it was domestic. Okay, it's a kind of, in part, it's a kind of a press announcement, you know, you send it out so that people will know Congress has made this decision. But couldn't you have simply sent out the Lee resolution that the Congress passed on July 2nd, that these United Colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states? Wouldn't that have kind of done it if you wanted it out? But if someone's going to stand there in the State House of Boston, you know, they should have something a little more than that. And also there was, this is about inherited forms, this, is the, this was a, an English tradition which is sort of ironic if you think about it. That the British had displaced, what is it, seven kings since the 14th century, 14 living kings, but never did it casually. <laughs> if you're going to get rid of a king, you had to issue an explanation. And by the 18th century there were only two acceptable explanations because the explanations you issue become precedents. Precedents become limits. By the 18th century you could only get rid of a living king if he was inept. And the term for this, and I always want to, interesting, people find this as funny as I do, a rex inutilis. Is that funny? Is that, think of how many inutilis things there you might find in your life, you know, husband inutilis, the dean inutilis, I don't know, <laughs> a child, I don't, inutilis, Rex inutilis, it meant he was just useless, he just couldn't do anything, he was inept. And the other was that he was, he was evil, and evil in the sense of interfering with the rights and liberties of the people. So in that, basically what the Declaration of Independence said is that with regard to us, not maybe for the English people, they have to speak for themselves, but with regard to us, he's been an evil king and listed out the reasons. And of course, the list itself had an English president in the Declaration of Rights of 1689. But he changed, Jefferson changed the words from by, 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 his interfere with the rights of by, by, by. He, he, he has, he has, he has. I find that very interesting. I mean, it's it's within the tradition, but he also changes it so that the almost the change in the literary form expresses the content of the document. We're not simply mimicking our English ancestors. We may be within this tradition of explaining, but that we don't need to do it exactly as they did. We'll do it our own way. <laughs> Uh, it's, it, it is a beautiful literary statement. I mean, I've never, I've, I, although I do think Jefferson is, or was until lately when he's sort of beaten up, I think he really was the most overrated. But that was just a measure of how much we overrated him. It wasn't, you know, it just, it happened after he was dead. He had no idea it was coming. <laughs> it was not his fault. <laughs> but he got a lot of credit for a lot of 
um, a lot. But it's a beautiful, I mean, yes. Uh, the interesting, most interesting changes are in the opening paragraphs, I think, because the, the traditional one started with a whereas clause. When in the course of human events, now that is, the, I mean, that sort of it takes your breath away. What a beautiful inspiration. And I would think what it must have meant to those soldiers in New York who were gathered there seeing, you know, these ships coming in. Well, you know, 50 one day, 100 the next day. And here they were, inexperienced, ill-equipped. And they were going to face the most important, powerful army in the Western world. And, you know, it, mostly what they must have thought is, we're going to get smashed. And then this declaration is read publicly it mu t that we're involved with something so important that mankind will have an opinion on it. It must have been a terrific shot in the arm. There must have been a lot of morale it produced. So and it sounds like it, it was very inspiring. I think so. Read orally, it's very inspiring. It had to be read aloud. Uh, it, it, there was an, uh, there's a book that claims Jefferson had to read it and put little marks on how to read it. I was never persuaded. I was never persuaded. That, um, because it, when I read it with the little marks, it just sounded sing-song. Have you ever tried it? Uh, it's in the, if you read it out loud, you say, well, <laughs> this is an improvement. This is, uh, you know, a, a good playwright doesn't have to be a good actor. He gave the lines, but somebody else had to read them. Jefferson was not a good speaker. Uh, but the words read beautifully. In fact, I don't know, and it, as you teach, sometimes when you teach, a student says something, and you say, you know, if I'd have paid him and planted him, I couldn't have come up with any better line. I always teach that edited version of the Declaration of Independence. That's in Appendix C of the book. And we look really hard to see what Congress did. It's a wonder, if any of you ever teach, it's a wonderful teaching document because there's no real official explanation of why Congress did what it did. It took the draft declaration and it went into the Committee of the Whole and no record was, ma was kept except by Jefferson who kept a very bad record because he was, Oh, well, you know, his ego was being smashed up. They were, they were playing with his words, and what he said made no sense at all, if you look at it really hard. It's quoted all the time, but it makes no sense at all. Uh, so we're looking at it to try to look for patterns in the changes. It's the only way you can figure out why is to look hard at what they did. And the eye always goes to that long paragraph on the slave trade that they took out. At the end of his sequence, of charges against the king. And one of my students said, you know, this isn't written very well. <laughs> you know, this is where I thought if I'd planted him, I couldn't, I couldn't have come up with a better line. I said, what do you mean? Well, he says, you know, it's confusing. And I said, read it out loud. And he read it, and you know, everybody was just sort of, try it yourself. It's, it, it's convoluted. Jefferson worked very hard on that paragraph. It's overwritten. He wanted it to be the emotional high point because he was so angry at the king for interfering, for one thing, with Virginia's efforts to restrict the slave trade. Uh, it would tax slave imports. It tried to tax slave imports to reduce the number of uh, the increase in the slave population would become a security issue and the king vetoed it and he did it for several other colonies as well. This really had Jefferson angry. The first uh, grievance and the last were essentially the same. That's really what he was talking about. But he attacks the king as if he is personally responsible for the slave trade. It's as if the man got on the ship at Liverpool and says, See ho, off to Africa. And then he snapped his, with his little whip and got these black men on the ship and said, off to the Caribbean, you know, and just led them and snapped his, he did all this. He was personally responsible for it. Well, that's crazy. <laughs> he wasn't. And then the ending is especially complicated. He uh, accuses the king of being a tyrant because he offered to free the slaves. It's 
kind of complicated, right? <laughs> and, it, and it doesn't read well, partly because the reasoning is so muddy. Uh, so anyway, the student read this and uh, uh, he said, you know, what do you think of it? Everybody goes, I cannot, you not understand it. It just didn't register. I said, now try the second paragraph. And here it was zing, 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 zing. You know, it really worked as a piece of, of, uh, of, of, of spoken literature. Uh, so the Congress had a lot of reasons for taking that paragraph out. You know. He couldn't write a motion, I think. I don't think he could really, you know, he's, he couldn't convey emotion. It, 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 and the document, when, when he tried, it didn't quite work. It also doesn't work toward the end when he's so angry at the British people. It's just muddy, I think. And the Congress slished it up and did a beautiful job of editing. And here he got the credit for all the work those editors did. And he was so resentful of them for messing up his prose. But they made the end like the beginning. You know, the beginning is crisp. They made the end more crisp. They made it more consistent. The document we love is Congress's Declaration of Independence. That's, uh, yeah. Editing is important. <laughs> a model of law. I mean, it's amazing. People always, you know, there's a joke about written by committee. But you, I don't think a committee can write something. Uh, a, a committee can edit. A committee can take out. It can say, we don't need this word. We don't need that word. That phrase would be better here. That you can do as a joint enterprise. And they did it beautifully. The, the odd thing is that we just have no record of it. Ex again, ex except for Jefferson. No, no. You know, Jefferson wrote, let me give you an example of what he said that's totally unpersuasive. He said, the reason Congress threw that paragraph out was because a George in South Carolina wanted to continue the slave trade. Right, okay. Yeah. Right, okay. And that New England was so involved in it that uh, they felt a little guilty as so they went along with it. But think of what that means. He has, in his text, said the king is exclusively responsible for this. He forced it on us. And then he confesses in his notes on the debate that South Carolina and Georgia really want to import a whole bunch of more slaves. Well, you know, what he admitted was, was at odds with what he wrote on the text. So the text was misleading. To put it another way, it was a blatant lie. And so they just took it out. They just, you know, they made it more. <laughs> what? It never would have passed if they left that in. Well, whatever the well John Adams kind of liked it because he didn't like the slave trade. But, you know, still, it was, it was a big mistake. Know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, they took out a lot of things that were overstatements. Uh, yeah, they, they got it down to something which was believable and more accurate, and it was leaner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did a wonderful job, but, uh, you know, they don't know. And by, nobody was, of course, interested in this document for a very long time. It started to be important in the 1790s, but where people started to ask questions about why, how it was written, well, most of the people were dead. Uh, Adams and Jefferson were still around, and Charles Carroll, who had precious little to do with it. So there was nobody to say, you know, oh, yeah, I'll tell you how we did it in Congress. You know, um, we don't know if there was some one guy that sort yeah. of did it all, or if it was this guy and that guy and someone over there who... Such a big hole in history. Yeah, well, we can see what they did. And even that takes some ingenuity because the documents are missing. I mean, this is, I, I used to say the, uh, we don't have the copy of the committee report that was submitted to Congress. In fact, we don't have the document that Congress approved on July 4th. I once gave a talk to a bunch of high school students and said, well, these documents have disappeared and some smart ninth grader or something said to me, well, we just had Professor Joanne Freeman from Yale here, and she says whenever someone tells her it's disappeared, she goes looking for it. What's the matter with you? <laughs> yeah, I figure there have been a lot of people looking for it. They said, yeah.
<laughs> you know, it isn't just any old document. You know, everybody's looking for it because it's worth millions of dollars. You know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, if you find it, let me know. But I, I said, well, hooray for Joanne Freeman. <laughs> but, you know, if you think about it, it's, you know, it's everybody's conscious. What do we have? All right. What we have is, of course, the Dunlap printing. Oh, sometime if I come here, I should bring these. I've got a, you know, the next time the Red Sox win, I'll come, <laughs> I'll come again. <laughs> I've got some uh, PowerPoint printings of the uh, of the various uh, uh, prints of the of images of the various printings of the Declaration, which are actually very interesting. Um, we have the Dunlap broadside, which was the first printing. It is signed by John Hancock, and it has Charles Thompson's name, basically as Secretary of the Congress, attesting to ha the legitimacy of Hancock's signature, which of course appears only in block letters. It's not cursive. This, this, this is the one that Norman Lear bought, and uh, what I've forgotten, how, it's millions. It was it's somewhere between 7 and 11 million, and, and everybody is sort of interested in this, uh, which means that a lot of historical societies that used to have a copy of the Dunlap Broadside and just put them up, you know, now they put it up for a few minutes, and then they have to put it in the safe. So it's 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 unfortunate. Uh, but then there's also the signed document. What happened, of course, was that when Congress finally approved it on July well on July second, the Lee resolution was passed by twelve to nothing, with New York <laughs> abstaining. And then New York agreed a week later. Said, "Oh, I guess we have to." Too bad, but all right, if everybody else is going to do it, we'll do it too. I mean, enthusiasm was lacking. Uh, they went along with it, and then Congress ordered that it be written up by a scribe, engrossed, and they signed it on August 2nd, but actually they signed it through the fall because some and the people who signed it weren't the people who were there that approved it on July 4th because some people at home, other people. And then through the fall, some new congressmen arrive and say, hey, could I sign the Declaration of Independence? Oh, sure, they said, and they pull it out. And he added his, they added his Han John Hancock. That went on to January when finally they printed it up and sent it out after those victories at, at Trenton and, and uh, at Princeton because they, it showed it could work. But you know, the image we have in our mind isn't that. You know where the image in our mind comes from? It's from another document, and there are two copies at the Mass Historical Society. It's the stone facsimile of 1823. Uh, by the time people started getting interested in this, well, you know, it was approaching the 50th anniversary of independence, and there were a couple commercial versions of the Declaration that were published. Uh, one made no effort to replicate the text, but the man was a, a handwriting expert, and he carefully copied the signatures of all of, the, all of the, the people who signed it. And the other was a decorated version. It has what looks like a necklace with little medallions in it, and at the top is Washington and Hancock and Jefferson and, who, and then 13 states. Who's missing? Who was the leading advocate of independence in the... Adams. Adams. And his son was Secretary of State. And the Congress talked about taking this decorated version by John Binns and buying a lot of copies and distributing them. And instead, John Quincy Adams had a better idea. <laughs> he had the one and only facsimile of the declaration made. He wasn't going to give, give bins whose politics were different than his and who didn't respect the role of John Adams, that kind of, uh, of, of, of publicity or support. So he had William Stone engrave it. Uh, and it, you know, Stone gets a really bad press. It, it's a beautiful document. You know, it's, it's huge. Of course, it's a sign of the, ori the original. Not many of us have really seen the original. If we see it, it's all faded. If you've been in the National Archives, right? 
I mean, half the names you just don't even, they're not even there. Now I guess they brought it down far enough you can see it. We used to look at it up there and they'd say, keep moving, the declaration is to be seen, not read. Keep moving, keep moving. Now I guess you can look at it, but it's not there. And in fact, it wasn't all there by the late, by, by around 1820, it started to fade already. But then Stone uh, used this version, which I think is a, a wet press version, where literally you, he put something over the declaration and, and must have lifted the image and then filled it in and engraved it on a copper plate. So it's, it's this pretty exact image of the declaration. And then he printed, and he printed it a, a hundred, or 201 copies, I think, on parchment. He kept one himself, and the others were distributed to a list determined by Congress, and then he threw some others off on cheaper paper. <laughs> uh, but these are glorious documents, and every image we have goes back not to the original, but to this facsimile, which no American knew what it looked like unless they happened to go in and say, could you pull that out? Hey, I'd like to see it. Oh, sure, we'll show it to you. We'll pull it up. This is the first time it was printed and distributed, and it's 1823. So, you know, it's a funny, it's got a funny documentary history that we don't have the committee report, or we've got the Dunlap broadside, we've, we've got Jefferson's versions of the committee report, which he sent around to show people what a mess Congress had made of his beautiful writing. And if you compare these copies that Jefferson made to the Dunlap broadside, which was to be authenticated by the, by the chairman of the drafting committee, that is Jefferson. So it is an authenticated version of what Congress agreed to. If you take that text and compare it to Jefferson's text, as I do in Appendix C, following the example of Carl Becker long ago, uh, you can see the changes quite easily that, were, that, that the Congress made. But it takes some ingenuity uh, because of what happened to those documents. Well, I don't know. I had a great theory that you know they were the same thing, that the the Congress took the committee report and marked up all the changes. But I, you know, they must have printed it out, because how do you edit something? You can't hold a whole text in your head. You know, would they read a paragraph and say what? I think they had a piece of paper in front of them. Uh, but they might have recorded them finally on the original committee draft and then sent it to the printer. When he was done, he said, well, who needs this? Uh, but somebody said paper was valuable. They probably wouldn't have done that. So maybe if Joanne Freeman gets on the job, she'll find it. <laughs> Where is it? Probably, I don't really know. National Archives, I would like to say the Library of Congress, but I suspect it's in the National Archives if it's an official document. That tends to be the, uh, the line of division, uh, that the National Archives get the official documents and the, and the Library of Congress has all the other good stuff. <laughs> it is a very legal document. Yes. And, you know, and, and so you're thinking about this, you're looking for something more, I mean, but the effects are really the importance of that document. Right, right, right. Good point. You'd like it to be eloquent, but it didn't have to be. Yeah. Of course, it isn't that Lincoln wasn't capable of eloquence. He was also a lawyer, as was, as was Jefferson. The Bill of Rights is quoted quite often in the courts in the Commonwealth of Mass um, by lawyers about the Code of Civil Which, which the, uh, uh, when the Massachusetts the one or the, or the federal well, one? I think the Massachusetts, when they argue right. to the judge on motions right. and on that, and then the Bill of Rights, I'm like, what's Bill of Rights? And then the Constitution <laughs> and the Declaration and the Declaration, the Bill of Rights, and now I know. Now you know. I have, I yeah, have a yeah, idea. yeah, yeah, yeah. But then I just take it. Down. But there is a little booklet of the. Are you going to do the state constitutions in this class? There's a little booklet actually that Massachusetts publishes of the, of the state declaration with uh, state constitution with all of the amendments after it. Mm. 
if, if you have to be really careful in using some of these documents. I think New Hampshire, st does New, I think New Hampshire still has its first state constitution too. I don't know, I only think that because I looked up on, on the internet for the constitution of 1784. No, well, maybe, maybe it's been, but they had all, they had read the amendments into the text on the state official website. And it was very confusing because I, what I was looking for uh, was the original text. And it wasn't, it wasn't there. Uh, for, for example, in the ratifying convention, several people in New Hampshire, uh, in the New Hampshire ratifying convention, were really upset by the last provision in Article 7, which says there'll be no religious test for office. And it turns out New Hampshire required that uh, both uh, representatives and senators and the governor and the delegates to Congress, and I think the members of the governor's council had to be Protestants. And if you look at the, the Constitution on the website, you'll never figure that out. <laughs> you know? A couple of them, they say they took it out, but in other places, I don't think they did take it out. Or I mean, I don't. I don't think they would say that it was amended. Just, yeah. Just to go back to the, the diversion in New Hampshire, but at what point did the colonists, assuming that they did, stop considering themselves British or, or British subjects? You, you talked about how, in fact, how they were, were British. They never right. Right. Considered themselves not being British. Well, I. I guess I take 70, 70, 1776 as much as any other year. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, on the other hand, there remained a kind of an affection for a cultural and, and a cultural affinity uh, that didn't go away overnight. Yeah. Um, I grew up in a town that's kind of like famous for its tourist and loyalist town. center. Yeah. What kind of made people be loyalists versus people uh -huh. who were really It's a wonderful question, and there's been a lot of ink spilled on it. For one thing, trying to figure out how many there were. And I think the scholarly consensus is something like 20% of the population. Uh, why, who and why are the other issues? And one thing that's been uh, pointed out is that unassimilated minorities tended to be loyalists. That makes some sense if you think about it. Uh, there are, uh, most French people, uh, French Protestants in the, this country assimilated very easily. But there's one community that didn't, and I think New Rochelle, and they were loyalists. Uh, wherever unassimilated minorities, I think that makes some sense. They may have felt that their rights were more protected under the crown than they would be under uh, a, a, an American majority, which would be asking them to conform to norms, uh, community norms. On the same basis, Anglicans in Connecticut tended to be loyalists. You're from Connecticut? And what's your town? Darien, was it, there were a lot of loyalists, or a lot of uh, Anglicans there? Mm, probably. I don't know. I don't know Darien in, in particular, but I know the Anglicans in Connecticut. Well, again, they could well expect that their religious rights to practice as they chose would be more defended by the king who was the head of their church than by a congregational majority. The other is people on the frontier. And it, uh, it Often it was just because they didn't know what was going on. I mean, everybody was loyal in the beginning. They became disloyal from going through a whole series of grievances and, and the news from Britain and fighting it through over an 11-year period. If you weren't party to that, you just never changed. Now, the really interesting people, however, are those in families along the coast who knew everything that was going on. and. One brother becomes a loyalist and another brother becomes a revolutionary. Uh, the Quincy family has, is one that I can think of. Uh, 
Uh, often it turns out that the, the uh, member of the family that is loyalist had some kind of a crown appointment. Uh, Josiah Quincy's brother, I think, was a judge. And anyone who had an appointment from the crown uh, felt some obligation to defend the crown and probably stuck with it, not understanding the implications until it was way too late to, to backpedal. Uh, the one group in the population that was loyalist out of, out of all proportion to its incidence in the population uh, were people who held crown appointments. And that goes from justice of the peace on through royal governors. So uh, it's a complicated, it's a com there's, 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 it, it wasn't rich people versus poor people either. I mean, it may be that wealthy merchants that had ties to Britain, economic ties, were more likely, were, were more resistant to independence than others. But there were a lot of just ordinary mechanics and farmers who were loyalists too. Uh, and that's harder to explain. Yeah. Immediate reaction. Great. Wonderful. How long before people said, oh my God, what have we done? And fear set in. And then how long after that before they said, okay, we're going to be all right? Well, there were an awful lot of people in New Jersey who signed loyalty uh, forms to the king, loyalty oaths to the king in 1776, <laughs> including one guy who signed the Declaration of Independence. Why? Because it sure didn't look good. Uh, I mean, you know, 1776 was a disastrous year on the battlefield. Uh, we lost in, in Brooklyn, lost Manhattan, uh, Washington retreats, then uh, the White Plains, and then he retreat, retreated down the Hudson, across the Delaware. Uh, it was a devastation. He, even he said he thought it was all over. Those people in New Jersey, now there's some more loyalists for you. Were they loyalists by conviction? Loyalists because they thought their liberties would be safer under the crown? I don't think so. They were covering their tail. Mm -hmm. They thought that the Americans were going to lose and they didn't want to suffer the punishment for traitors, which was death and confiscation of estate. So they signed these loyalty oaths to the to the crown. They were just covering their tail, and by uh, after then, of course, at the end of the year, Washington has his victory at Trenton, and then recrosses the the Delaware again to have a second battle at Trenton, and the one really brilliant maneuver of his whole career, which his military most recent military biographer says was not repeated. <laughs> at Princeton, where he actually went behind the British lines to get at their base in Princeton. Uh, after that, the whole situation changed quite dramatically. Uh, David Hackett Fisher uh, wrote about this in, what, what is the book, it, Wash Washington's Crossing, uh, how that whole situation in New Jersey totally changed, so that by the spring of 1777, really, the British were on the defensive. And the country was held by little militia groups. And, that, and you know, you, you, would, you make a big deal about this. Oh, the Americans. Fought. You know, if you were in an area where if the British really couldn't tell the difference between a loyalist and a, and a revolutionary, and so they just mistreated everybody, and there was apparently an epidemic of thefts and, and rapes and all kinds of mis, uh, uh, mistreatment of the, of, of the population. You know, I don't think you have to be a great patriot to say I'm not taking this anymore <laughs> and to organize, to fight it off. It's like these little community, you know, uh, policing organizations you used to get in some bad neighborhoods. It, you know, I, I think you can go too far with this, but it, it, that they did organize and resist it really changed the whole situation around dramatically in New Jersey by early 1777. And then, yeah. You know, then Saratoga was really nice. And the French came in, and from there on, we had a chance of winning. We like to forget we needed the French, but oh, God, did we need the French. <laughs> Washington didn't know how to do a siege. He had no combat experience, really, at least no successful combat experience. He couldn't have pulled it off at Yorktown without Rochambeau telling him what to do. 
good man. I'm not meaning to demean Mr. Washington. He was a great leader and he looked the part. <laughs> and you know, and he held it. He held his place through the war. He was, and he, he, he left a terrific hero uh, correctly. In fact, I think he is the, he was, he was a great man. Uh, there's, uh, you know, if there's a definition of great man, Washington fits it. Tremendous sacrifice uh, uh, in the war and afterwards. For, the, for this, for his country, he lived by his philosophy, which was that your first obligation was to your country, and not to your convenience. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, sir, can you imagine how all the Native Americans felt that support of the British colonies uh, uh, after the um, colonists had gained, gained independence? Well, it must have been most heartbreaking, but actually that whole John Sullivan campaign in the West in 1778-79 was devastating. Uh, they just went through those Indian villages, and oh, it breaks my heart as a, as a, a dedicated, they cut down their fruit trees. <laughs> you know, I guess that's the least of it. He forced people out of their villages. Uh, they were devastated. They were starving, go through the winter without shelter. I mean, uh, it, it was a nasty war in the West. Yeah. I was so much thinking about that. I was thinking about, like, um, I mean, the, the, how much land was left to those Native Americans after the colonists came in the Well, they were holding pretty well their land in the Northwest. It was only the Battle of Fallen Timbers in the 17, was it 94? Uh, Matt Anthony Wayne managed to beat them before that. They, the Northwest Territory is really open to settlement. They held their own pretty well. Uh, they uh, actually, this one book I've been re reviewing, Woody Houghton, has a, a, has a very interesting uh, description of Indian diplomacy in the 1780s. And it, this is one reason why the Congress, you know, didn't have any money. It couldn't sell Western land and it couldn't sell it because the Indians weren't getting off. <laughs> you know? They wouldn't even let them survey the land. They had to survey seven plots before they could sell any under the land ordinance 1785. And the Indians wouldn't let them finish the seventh, so they couldn't sell anything. It was, it was sort of an interesting story. <laughs> yeah. Um, you find yourself today, you being in a country where you've had more loyalist populations than there, I was thinking of like the South and you know, the upper uh, at Kings Mountain, you also had a, a loyalist community. Right, you did. And there are, that's right, an important group. Uh, my sense is that probably the frontier. The, la the West, more than any, uh, certainly North, South, or Middle colonies, I don't think. What would you say? I think, I, I think the, the British power feel it was that there are a lot of loyalists somewhere else, and we just have to find Oh, them. yes, they kept thinking somewhere else, somewhere over the rainbow. There are so many Americans that want to support us. I mean, they went into <laughs> this war on the most ridiculous <laughs> intelligence. I mean, it makes Iraq look under, you know, sort of, <laughs> you know, sort of not so much of an outlier. They had all these people like Joseph Galloway saying, oh, most of the people really want to be uh, loyal. They don't want independence. Uh, they're just a, a handful, a small fraction or a faction of, co of these colonists who are making all the noise and they're coercing the others into uh, pretending to favor their policies. Send an army in and it'll all melt away. Well, they tried that in New England. And you remember what happened? <laughs> Before you know it, they were all holed up on, on Boston, uh, the whole British army. And then they decided, well, maybe New England doesn't have a lot of loyalists, but we'll find them in New York. We'll find them in the middle colonies. <laughs> and then by 1778, they said, well, you know, it wasn't everything we expected. We'll find them in the South! <laughs> and uh, it didn't happen there either. They kept looking for loyalists everywhere. But if there were any, I think they were in places that were out of communication lines. That's, that's the only regional bias I can think of. You mentioned a couple of things a little bit about uh, men coming from the South. And yeah. um, right now, right now. Oh, are you? Yeah. I was really interested, actually. Um, I came across um, con considering a uh, century celebration of yeah. the Royal Ark um, ah. chapter of St. Andrew. Now, those 
surprised to see that uh, a lot of the British soldiers who actually were in Boston yes, were Masons. Were, were actually members of the same council, ah. along with Warren and other people. Huh. You know, I don't really know much about that. I haven't read what's his name's book on the Masons, which I really, sh yeah, I really should, but I haven't. Have you read it? No. Okay, well then you can answer his okay. question, <laughs> right? <laughs> But what does Steve Bullock say? Well, yeah, he says that there's this great brotherhood and they say, well, yeah, yeah. Um, but what, what, really, what I was really surprised is that some of these guys in the same lodges, these revolutionaries, with the same soldiers actually fired on the crowd. Oh, you mean both sides were in yeah, the same right, chapter? Yeah. Huh. Where'd you find this out? Uh, in a uh, old book. It was the uh, celebration of the 125th anniversary of the Royal Arts Chapter of the City huh, of huh. Well, the Masons are really big on this history. They, of course, the Museum of Our National Heritage in Lexington yeah. is a Masonic I institution. I the, um, the Samuel Crocker Library here at the Boston Lodge, and I was surprised how little was written about this era. Huh. I mean, with regard to Masons in particular. Yeah, I mean, the era in general has written. quite a bit written on it, yeah. Yeah. but not this particular component. Yeah. I don't. I, I can't add to anything. Um, so, it's a good topic. Right. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. <laughs>